Chronicles chapter 21. Last week, we saw when we were together that David, in the end of his life, had made some mistakes. Matter of fact, he did some sins and had some attitudes in his life he did not have there in previous times. Pride crept up in his heart, in his life, to the point that he said, I want to have a census, and I want to find out how great a nation that I have, how many people do I have, and especially how many fighting men do I have. Not only that, he realized that he might need to do that in order to find out that he had enough to defend himself. Because instead of being God-sufficient, that he had always been in his life, he's finding himself to be self-sufficient. And he's dependent on how many of the military he might have. And in that situation, he's turned away from God, and he's allowed some things to happen in his life that we talked about. At the end of his life, in that journey, he's finding it difficult to stay pure and holy and right in relationship to the Lord, just like we do. It doesn't get any easier. Each day has its own challenge. Each day has its own journey. Each day has its own things that we're going to have to encounter. And sometimes those more difficult things may come at the end of our life rather than at the beginning of our life. And so we have to be ready each and every day, amen, ready to walk with the Lord, to serve the Lord. Well, whenever that happened and he called for that census, God was angry. God was angry at David because of the pride of his heart, because of his lack of trusting in him. And therefore, God said there's going to be a judgment that's going to come on this nation because of you. And you have a choice. He had one of three choices. You remember that? He had the opportunity of falling into the hand or three years of famine. Of three months of fall in the hands of some enemy, or of three days of pestilence to fall in the hand of the Lord. And David said, I don't want to fall in the hand of the enemy. So what I do is I ask you to have mercy on me, but I'll fall into your hands in pestilence. And through those three days of pestilence, 70,000 people fell that day, or those days. 70,000 people died. And all of that because of the sin of David and because he had turned away from the Lord. But in regard to that, whenever God was going to destroy everybody, God could destroy David. God showed mercy. He always was a God of mercy. I want you to know that, that even in times, whenever God has to discipline us, that it's great to know God's a God full of love and kindness and mercy. I'm glad to know that. Because if not, he would have taken me out a long time ago. Amen? He would have just gotten rid of me a long time ago. But he doesn't do that. He disciplines us. He cares for us, but he does it in loving, kindness, and mercy. And what we're going to see today is that God is a God who still speaks, who still restores, who still ministers to people, even though we've messed up. He's still the God who speaks to us, who cares for us, who receives offerings from us, and who answers by fire. Three things I want you to see today in this story. One thing is I want you to see the word of the Lord. I want you to see that the word of the Lord comes to David. The second thing I want you to see is I want you to see the sacrifice that God receives and how we give and what we give and a sacrifice to God. And the third thing we'll talk about is that God answers by fire. God answers by fire. Look what it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I'm again reading in verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad, remember he was the prophet who was speaking to David. He commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. I need to stop there for just a minute. A couple things I want you to underline. This is what it says. The angel, verse 18, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad, underline this, to say to David, that's important, to say to David, go speak to David, I have a word for David. Then verse 19, so David went up, here's the, underline this, at the word of Gad that he spoke, which is the word of the Lord that he spoke to Gad who spoke to David. Now, that might not seem like something important to you. Why would I have you to underline that or circle that? Here's the important thing. Remember, David is blown it. David is messed up. He's let pride creep in his heart. He's caused, caused his nation to experience judgment. He's had things that he says God hates such things as pride, the wickedness of his heart. God hates those things. And in that situation, if God didn't speak to him, we would all feel justified or that God would be justified in the fact that he didn't speak. I mean, he's blown it. He's messed up. 
But here's the truth you need to write down. That even though David has messed up, even though David has sinned, even though David has caused there to be pestilence to come into his nation, even though the sin of David has cost those people their lives and it cost fellowship with God, even though that's true, God still speaks a word to David. He still speaks a word to David. He has the prophet Gad. He says, go and say to David, this is what I want you to do. According to the word of God that he spoke to Gad, who spoke to David, this is the command that I give to you. These are the instructions that I give to you. He spoke to David, even though David had sinned, even though David had blown it, even though it messed it up. Now that's important to me because God does that for me as well. And he does that for you as well. Sometimes we have a failure in our lives because we want to make God like us. Now, if you're ever trying to make God like you, I'm here to tell you, you're really uh, hurting yourself and you're really misrepresenting God because God's a lot better than you. He's a lot better than me. And I'm glad that he is. Now, why do I say that we make God like us? Because... Some of us, whenever we get our feelings hurt, whenever somebody sins against me, whenever somebody does something wrong and hurts me some way, that there's a way that I would choose to respond. Some of us might choose to respond this way. One is that we just won't ever talk to them again in our whole life. I'm not ever talking to them again in my whole life. I don't care what they do. I don't care what they say. I'm cutting them off. I don't have a relationship with them. I'm not going to speak to them. I'm not going to have a thing to do with them because they did me wrong. Because they hurt my feelings. Because they said something. Because they went the wrong path. I'm not going to talk to them again. Now, I know none of you who are in this service ever respond that way. It's that other service over there that responds. <laughs> none of us would ever do that. Oh, we don't? In our day we live in, in our lives, in our journeys, in our pains, in our hurt, have you ever had a temptation? Have you ever in your life responded that way? I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I'm through with them. They've had every opportunity. I've been kind to them, good to them. Look what they've done to me. I'm not ever going to speak to them again. Well, first of all, let's deal with that. That's wrong. Okay? That's wrong. You shouldn't be that way. First of all, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the other person. And if you think that you're getting back at the other person, you're just fooling yourself. You're not getting back at the other person. You're just making your own life miserable. The other person usually doesn't even know you're not talking to them. <laughs> they don't even know you're not talking to them. But you do, and you know why you've done it. It hurts yourself. You're doing the wrong thing. You shouldn't do that, all right? But here's the real problem. The real problem is when you respond that way, that you turn around and you think God might respond that way. See, whenever you respond that way, you have in your mind, whether you know it or not, that may be the way God responds to me. I bet that's what God does to me. I mean, if, if I don't talk to somebody because they've done me wrong, then naturally God probably doesn't talk to me when I've done him wrong. The old enemy comes up and he grabs hold of that. And he waters that seed that's in your heart and your mind. And, and you'll get to the point that you think God doesn't care about you. And God's not going to talk to you because you've disappointed him. You've hurt him. You've done something to offend him. He doesn't want to have anything to do with you. And you will believe that lie. And that lie will affect you spiritually. It will hinder you in your walk. And there's not a shred of truth in it anywhere. It's the lie that you believe because you've been like that. You think God might be like that. And that's the way God's responding to you. Well, I told you before, God's a lot better than you and me. He never responds that way. If he were going to respond that way, he would respond that way to David. But he didn't. He says, not David. He says, to the prophet, the angel of the Lord says, you go and you say to David this. You go and you give the word of the Lord to David, which is this. I'm the one, God says, who will initiate the conversation. 
speaks and talks and shares and loves. That's who God is. And if you've got a wrong view of that, if you don't see God that way, then you need to grab hold of that. And you need to understand how God sees and what God understands. You need to understand that because your life is going to be hindered in believing that lie that God's like you. He's not. He's better. He's better than you. And he shows them. And then he gives the word. He not only gives the word to David, he gives the word to us. Now just think about it historically. Think about it in the application of your life. What is something you've done recently? Not something you did 20 years ago. You know, we like to think things we did 20 years ago. What have you done something recently? How have you blown it something recently? And, and in your heart, in your mind, you think God feels a certain way about you. Or God's upset with you. Or God's not going to talk to you. How is that? Put that out of your heart and your mind. And understand that God is the one who's going to speak to you. He's going to talk to you. He's going to help you know what you did. He's going to help you know how to make it right. You got it in your heart? You need to have it in your heart. You need to apply that. There's a word. God speaks in that situation. What else happened? Verse 20. Now Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons were with him, hid themselves, and Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, he owned that, he owned the threshing floor where the wheat was being threshed, and he owned that property in that place. And, and God had told him, said, I want you to go and buy that, and I want you to build this altar for the Lord here on this threshing floor. Look at verse 21. And, as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and prostrated himself before David with his face to the ground. Look at verse 22. Then David said to Ornan, Give me the sight of this threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. For the full price you shall give to me that the plague may be restrained from the people. And Ornan said to David, Take it for yourself, and let my Lord the King do what is good in his sight. See, look at this. I will give the oxen for burnt offering, and the threshing sledges for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all. Look at verse 24. But King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord. Underline this phrase. Or offer a burnt offering which cost me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by way for that sight. What did God tell him? I want you to buy the threshing floor. I want you to build me an altar right here. This is going to be a place where I'm going to meet with you. I want you to offer a guilt offering. I want you to offer a peace offering. I want you to offer a burnt offering. I want you to come, and I want to meet with you here at this place. Well, David didn't own that place. Ornan, the Jebusite, owned it. And so he goes to Ornan, and Ornan knows that something special is happening here, too. I mean, you know how he knows it? Ornan sees the angel of God, and his four sons see the angel of God. That angel of God that is that is kind of between heaven and earth, just there for them to see. Not on earth, not in heaven. But right there, just before them, they can see it. And whenever they see the angel of the Lord, it says they hid themselves. They hid their faces because they realize something unique is happening here. God is here meeting with his man. That'd be pretty neat, wouldn't it? I mean, if an angel showed up who was between heaven and earth right here behind my head, and he starts talking, I think you'd realize something special is happening here. Something unique is taking place here. Well, they understood that. And what the angel said, this is the place where I will build that altar. And David goes and says, Warden, I want to buy this threshing floor. I want to buy this place. I want to buy it, and I, I want to buy the sacrifice, and I want to buy the, the bulls, and I, and I want to buy whatever it would take me to build the altar. I want to buy all of those things because this is the place that I am to offer a sacrifice. This is the place that I am to meet with God. And Ornan, who realizes something special is taking place, he says, you don't have to buy it. I'll give it to you. You can have it all. You can have the threshing floor. Yeah, I'll give you the bull. I'll give you the sledges from the threshing floor. I'll give it all to you. You just take it. You build that altar. You offer up to God. You do 
whatever needs to be done. I will give it all to you. But David said this. No. No. You cannot give it to me. I must buy it. I must purchase it. Not at a discount. But at the full price. I must purchase it at the full price. Because I cannot offer sacrifices with what is yours. And I refuse to offer a burnt offering that costs me nothing. The second word I want you to see was sacrifice. Remember the word from God. But there's a sacrifice. A sacrifice that is offered by David to God. And what is the result and what is the reason and what is the rationale behind that sacrifice? First of all, I want you to understand this. In the Old Testament, where there was sacrifices or burnt offerings that were offered, they were, there was nothing about them that could really take away sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, if you read that in the New Testament, it tells us that the blood of bulls and calves can never take away sin, but was only a reminder of sin. It reminds us of sin. Reminded them of sin. But it can never take away sin. There was only one blood, only one person's blood that could take away sin. And that would be the perfect Lamb of God. The perfect Lamb of God who had no sin and no blemish. And that perfect Lamb of God, we know on this side of the cross, that was Jesus. He was the Lamb of God. He was the perfect Lamb of God. There was no sin, no blemish in Him. And that whenever He came and died on the cross, He was offered on the altar of sacrifice. And His shed blood is what enables us to be forgiven of sin and have a relationship with God. It's all about Jesus. A person in the Old Testament or a person in the New Testament, every one of us are saved by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. That is the only hope we have, the only help there is, the only plan God ever had. You understand that? But back in the Old Testament time, which is where David lived, they offered sacrifices on the altar of sacrifice as a faith offering and a picture of that one who was going to come who would be the perfect Lamb of God. They knew that the blood of bulls and calves, that offering wasn't going to forgive them, but they did it by faith, saying, we believe there is one who's coming who's going to be the sacrifice for our sin, who's going to pay that sacrifice, and who's going to make us whole. And we offer these bulls, and we offer these calves, we do this as a statement of our faith. But that payment has to be made by God. The sin payment is always made by God. Not by us. So God had told him, I want you to go and on this threshing floor, I want you to offer a sacrifice. I want you to build an altar. Right here in this place, I want you to kill the bulls and I want you to offer up a burnt offering. I want you to offer a peace offering. I want you to do everything you need to do. And you do that as a recognition of your sin. That sin that it caused 70,000 people to die. That sin that it caused God's wrath to have to come on his nation that he loved. I want you to offer that sacrifice as a recognition of your sin. That can never take away your sin, but it is the recognition of your sin. You're to do that. That's what I require. He goes, and Ornan wants to give it to him, and, and David says this, there's no way you can give it to him. For the only way, listen, the only way that sacrifice is accepted, the only way the burnt offering will be received, the only way that God's purpose is accomplished, is this has to cost me something. It has to cost me something. There's something that I have to put into it, something I have to give to it. There's something that God wants of me. Something I've got to do. It's not my life. It's not my sacrifice. It's going to take away my sin. But there's something God wants of me. And he says, I have to purchase it. I have to buy it. I have to be invested. And so he bought it. And whenever he offers 
the sacrifice acceptable unto God. It accomplishes God's purpose. He knows exactly what he needs to do. And you might say, what's that got to do with us? I mean, we're not offering bulls and goats. And Jesus already died on the cross. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But let me tell you something. And this is very important for you to understand. You can get this in your heart and your mind. There is nothing that you can do whereby you can be saved. Jesus did all of that. Amen? He died on that cross. And the way that you're saved is you put your faith and trust in what Jesus did on that cross. He did for you. That his blood was shed for you. That he offered forgiveness of sin. Everything that needed to be done, Jesus did it. That's how we get to be saved. But here's what we must do in relationship to what David did. We don't have any sacrifice. There's nothing we can do to save our sin. It's what Jesus did for us. But hold on a second. In our very lives, in our very offering, in our very living, we should be involved in that which God is doing, and it should cost us something. It should cost us something, not to save us from our sin, but because we understand that what he did saves us from our sin. It should cost us something. We should, that's what sacrifice means. Sacrifice means to give up that which you have. It means that if you feel it, and one of the things that we're missing in our day and time, listen to me, with all my heart, I say this with all sincerity in my spirit. One of the things we have to be careful about is we have not got to, we cannot fall into this easy believism where all we have to do is say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. I'm going to do all I want to do and live how I want to live. It really doesn't matter anywhere. That's never been the plan of God. God asks us to give all that we have for him. And our very lives should be a, a sacrifice. It should be the fact that it cost us something. What's the most precious commodities you have? Your time? Let me ask you this. How is your time? Because of that sacrifice Jesus gave for you, he died on the cross for you, he paid the price for you. Because of that, what does it cost you in time? What do you do with your time? <laughs> do you not think it's worth something? To recognize the King of Kings died for you and he died on that cross for your sin to the point that it affects you in your life and you give of your time? For what? To serve him, to worship him, to honor him, to love him. You give of your time. And if you're living your life and you're not sacrificing the time, you need to begin to sacrifice your time. Because if not, you're like the people who say, well, I'm going to give a sacrifice, but I'm going to do it on somebody else's land, somebody else's bull, somebody else's dollar. I'm going to do that. David said, I can't do that. It's going to cost me something. That's how it's special to me. It's what it means to me. It means something to me. And you ought to give your time. Well, Brother Mac, I'm here at church this morning. Well, bless your heart. That's about an hour. <laughs> Well, I'm even going to go to Bible study. Well, that, bless your heart, that's two hours. <laughs> what are you doing with your time? Well, Brother Mike, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to do. What do you know how to do? You know how to add? You know how to use numbers? Take your gift, whatever your gift is. If you can add, God can use you in that adding ability and talent to do something. Amen? Well, can you fix a car? God can use you to fix a car. God can use you to repair a house. God can, what did God give you? And how are you using what God gives you to recognize the fact that God is the one who died and paid the price for you? You do not do that whereby you are saved. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You do it because he saved you. A precious commodity is time. A precious commodity is what I possess, what I own, my wealth. Why do you think God required us a tithe? You know, it's a tithe. Oh, man, I don't want to talk about that tithe. Man, I, I'm going to tell you something. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. Here is how good God is. God owns everything. Everything you have, he owns. Everything you have, he owns. And he could require every bit of it, or he could require 50% of it, or he could have asked for 90% of it, and he'd have been totally right in asking all that because he owns it all anyway. But let me tell you how good he is. 
myself that I invested something. Because of what Jesus means to me. Your time, your talents, your resources, your money, whatever. I don't know what it is, but it ought to cost us something. And it doesn't cost us something because we have to do it. It costs us something because we want to do it. What a privilege it is to get to do it. David cost him 600, remember? 600 dollars in our sense. David was a millionaire. He was wealthy. That seemed like, that's nothing. That's nothing. Well, it's nothing what God asks of us either. But God says in him buying, in him doing it, he was accepted. Let me show you the end result. He gives a word, and he asks for sacrifice. That cost us something. Here's the end result. Look what it says in verse 26. Then David built an altar to the Lord there, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he called the Lord, underline this, and he, God, answered with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offerings. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into its sheath. You know what, you know what God did? Whenever David did it right, and David did what he's supposed to do, he sets up the altar, he gets it prepared. And here's what happens. Listen. He doesn't burn up the altar. He doesn't burn up the sacrifice. He doesn't provide the fire. You know who provides the fire? God. God provides the fire. Man, there's some great times. If you're going to do a Bible study this week, just go in your concordance and look at the times when God provides the fire. Mount Carmel. Remember Elijah? Up there in these, we're studying that Sunday school this morning, my fifth and sixth grade. We talk about Elijah gets up there in the province of Baal and they're trying to call on their God and he never answered by fire and all, all Elijah just said, God, they just need to know that you're here. Would you please answer by fire? And boom! Fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, sucks up the water, consumes everything that's there. God answers by fire. Exact same thing right here. He offers the sacrifice. He gets it ready. He doesn't put the fire there. The fire of God comes down. You know what it means? God accepts it. God accepts it. God's presence is there. God's anointing is upon that place. You know why the anointing is so special? That God revealed to him, this is where I want to build the temple. We talked about that last week. We're not going to build it over here where the tabernacle is. We're going to build the, tab the temple right here in this place. And that's where the temple was built. Why? Because God answered by fire. God spoke. God required the sacrifice when David did it the way God said to do it. God answered by fire and it's his recognized presence. The presence of God. The power of God. The realization of God comes in that place. Wow, that'd be pretty deep, wouldn't it? If God just shot the fire down here, Wait a minute. We have something better. You know what it said in Acts chapter 2? In Acts chapter 2, whenever the Holy Spirit that God promised would come after Jesus said, I'm going up, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, it comes down. You know what it comes down? It says, and the fire, the tongues of fire came down. The Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life is the fire of God. It's the presence of God, the power of God in your life. You receive that when you got saved. Hold on a second. Do you feel it? Do you realize it? Do you know it? This, this is what God says to us. Listen. When you blow it, when you messed up, when you think nobody wants to talk to you, God wants to talk to you. God will tell you exactly what he knows and exactly how he feels about you and that he loves you and he'll make the way and show you the way whereby you will be restored. What God asks of you is not to die on the cross. Jesus already did that for you. But he, he asks of you to offer a sacrifice of your own life, your time, your resources, whatever you have. And that sacrifice is going to cost you something. God asks for that just so you let him know you appreciate what Jesus did. But if you will do 
that in your life, listen, the realized presence of God, the fire of God, will be restored to your heart. Restored to your life. Ministering to you. This is the key. Here's the key. Do you feel as close to God as you've ever felt in your life? Do you sense the presence of God in your life like at no other time? Or has there been a, another time in your life when you felt like you were closer to God, experienced the presence of God, and the power of God in your life at that time? Well, you can have just as much power and presence of God right now as at any other time. All God says is come to me with who you are. Let it cost you something. And realize who I am. Fire of God will come into your life. There's no more exciting life in all the world than a life that has the Spirit of God, the power of God flowing through us in our life. But there's no more miserable life, hold on, than to experience that power, to know what it is to walk in the presence and power of God, and to not be experiencing that now. Well, God, you just don't know, brother Matt. God's mad at me. No, it's not. I just talked to him. He's not. His word says he's not. His word says he speaks to you. That Jesus paid the price for you. And that if you'll come in your life and offer him a sacrifice of praise, let it cost you something. That the fire of God will be restored to your heart. If you don't have it, you need it. You need it. If you ever give your heart to Jesus, you need to give your heart to Jesus right now. It's not just all about getting to go to heaven. The great thing is, the Spirit of God fills your heart, your life. Fire and the presence of God comes to you right now. Even if you didn't go to heaven, I'm telling you, the best life is to have God in your heart and in your life to know what it is to 